Live! From and we are live! Alright, guys, welcome to uh, Believe in Magic Place Lecture. I'll be hosting, at least temporarily, Alex, uh, I'm your host, Alex Morton, and we have um, Morgan Strebler, who was supposed to be hosting this. He's running slightly late because of uh, some family issues. Uh, he takes care of his mother, and uh, he was doing that, and he will be here very shortly. Um, I will try to, like, not screw everything up in the meantime. So that being said, um, we have a lecture on urban shamanism today, and with that, I'm actually going to uh, leave it to our two guest stars, uh, Craig Browning and Art Vanderlei, to go ahead and give you guys uh, a bit of a uh, synopsis of what will be going on. Craig? Hello. Um, I'll let Art go into his side of things, but... Um... I'm sure most of you know who I am. I'm Craig Browning. I've been around this stuff for years, and um, as in magic. And um, Art and I have been colluding together on creating a book, which will be kind of like the Corinda for people that are involved with the uh, urban shaman movement within magic. So Art deals with the more etheric side of it, and I'll let him explain what he does first, and then we'll go into a little bit more. So Art. How are you doing? I'm Art Vandalay. Um, basically, I class myself as an elemental manipulator. It's a bit of a pretentious title, I know, but it's the only thing I can really think of that explains what I do. I play the role of a character who can control the elements. If you've seen the film The Last Airbender, that's kind of what I'm after. I can summon water to go upwards and jump <coughs> out of the sky. God bless you. I can apparently seem to do these in cra crazy things using Mother Nature, and a lot of my techniques rely on Mother Nature, much like cloud busting. So that's basically where I come from in this uh, scenario. So you mentioned you mentioned cloud busting, and on some levels, that's something that kind of rekindled my interest in this path. Um, I studied uh, true shamanism for years, uh, studying with the Hopi and uh, other Native American groups, and I've also studied a lot about different Earth religions. So it's a part of who I am, but. Um, the whole idea of making patterns in the sky with, with clouds and causing them to break up by focusing on them uh, goes all the way back to my childhood. Uh, I didn't realize it back then, but in retrospect, it was the what a lot of people are calling hoodoo these days, uh, mountain magic thinking. And it's just the way kids grew up seeing things, at least in my family. Um, I'm sure Art, Art and I have talked about this before, and I believe you also do nature walks, right, Art? I do, yes. And um, in doing that, you help people learn how to um, to do the breaking up of the clouds. Uh, I, sh I think we should mention um, the book Cloud Busting by uh, Luke, or not Luke Germain, but... Uh, by Finley, um, yeah, that's that's a great book. That's almost like um, elemental manipulation, you know, one hundred and one. Yeah, you want to get into elemental work? That's like the beginner's book for it, basically, to a certain extent. It covers a lot of things, and it's so much more than just cloud busting. And I think it gets not enough credit than it deserves. You there, Craig? Uh, I got a thing pop up on some kind of an app, and it took me away from everything. Yeah, same here. Was weird. Are you there, Alex? Yeah, I'm here. I apologize. Uh, the uh, toolbox uh, popped up, and uh, it probably just real quick loaded to your guys' screens. I apologize. That was probably my fault. Um, oh, I'm you. You're both still here, and we're both still live. We're all still yeah. live. So you guys can keep cool. uh, with it as you're going. I got it back. That's cool. Um, I rarely use Google, so I'm not familiar with all the silly things that happen in the Google universe. So, um, <clears throat> a large chunk of what 
I plan on doing with this um, chat is is a Q and A format. Um, I think it's the easiest way for us to answer people's questions. Uh, mm -hmm. well, uh, we have questions piling up, so okay. uh, whenever you want to get to those, I can start uh, asking them. Fire away, man! Fire away. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I think uh, a good one to really start off with, uh, Peter Bugnan, um was wondering uh, what uh, is Urban Shaman to each of you, and uh, how do you approach people to perform this style of effect? Okay, Art. Well, for me, Urban Shamanism is probably something different to, to everybody, but for me, it's been kind of hard to explain. Almost Dalai Lama-like, you know, just one with nature. <laughs> You know, I'm a completely different person as soon as I step outside of my house. I'm no longer, well, I, I think it's fair to say that everyone knows my real name isn't Art Van Der Leer. That's my pseudonym for when I write books. So I'm no longer the Matthew Townsend at home. I'm a completely different Matthew Townsend when I walk outside. I'm at one with nature. I dress differently. I you know, speak slightly differently. And it's basically being able to control the elements, control animals, control life itself, and just be able to do magic and miracles like what it spoke about in all these ancient texts, you know. Right? Okay. <clears throat> well, like I said, a lot of my background has to do with actual shamanism and, and <clears throat> earth study, as well as metaphysics and comparative religion. Um, a large number of the people that we have on the Urban Shaman Group here on Facebook are all deeply entrenched in spirituality, um, deeply invested in psychic type things or paranormal type things. Um, we created the group uh, predominantly not just at, to be a community but to be a safe haven for people that actually have belief in these type of things so they're not being persecuted by the naysayers out there. You guys know who you are. Um, um, I mean, a lot of you who know me know that I my, my quote-unquote day job is being a reader, but that ties in tightly to urban shamanism because a lot of us uh, that are involved with urban shamanism also do readings in one form or another. Um, it might help to give a little bit of a history as to how urban shamanism came to be. Uh, it goes back into the late 50s, early 60s with the development of Bizarre Magic. Um, and it slowly grew out of Bizarre Magic's roots. Um, probably in the 80s is where you really start seeing a difference with um, some of Jeff McBride's work with the mystery schools, uh, some of the things that Kenton Nepper has done over the years. But it's connecting with your spirit and your soul and making that a part of your magic and basically learning how not to do tricks but how to create enchantment, how to create miracles through what you're doing. Um, <clears throat> you know, something as simple as the gypsy thread can seriously affect people as a learning lesson, as, as a way of teaching them to go beyond their limitations. Um, and I bring that out for a couple of reasons. Urban shamanism uses a lot of the psychology that goes behind mentalism, but applies it to magic. In other words, we invoke belief when we perform, even though we might be doing something like the cups and balls. We use it as a way of teaching people about the impossible, about faith, about morals and, and so on and so forth, which magic as a genre has lost. Uh, we've gotten so involved with the commercialism and the ego trip of doing neat, neat things that we've forgotten where mysticism came from originally and why it's there. <clears throat> and I think that today's uh, public, especially when you look at the success of David Blaine, for an example, that today's public is hungry to recapture magic in their lives. Um, you said something there for a second, uh, if I can step in. 
um, that I think is somewhat really just a, an important point to make in that uh, there's too much emphasis on performing and not enough emphasis on actually affecting your audience, and that's affect, not effect. Um, because as a, as a performer, you're supposed to be connecting with your audience. You're supposed to be, uh, it doesn't matter what you do, if it's your music, if you're a painter, you're connecting with somebody. And uh, people, I think, lose sight of that and perform at people in general. And I think that's an all-compassing sort of statement um, within the entertainment industry. Well, I, I believe that um, there's a discussion going on the forum right now about, or one of the forums I'm on, about high art versus magic. And one of the examples that was brought up is how a uh, musician can pour themselves. You see them emotionally connected to their instrument as they create various sounds and sensations. Um, it's very difficult, it's not impossible, but it's very difficult for the stage magician to understand how to connect to that and do it because so many of us have been taught for so many years to not believe in magic. And how can you do something effectively when you don't believe it exists? Uh, that's, that's in a shorthand way, that's kind of what distinguishes the urban shaman from others. Uh, watch guys like J. Scott Berry or Jeff McBride. When Jeff does his water bowls, it's completely enchanting. Um, not to mention impossible. Um, and some of the stuff that I, I've seen J. Scott Berry do over the past 30-some years is just, it really reaches into the subconscious and makes us think and gives us inspiration. And I think that's the goal of the Urban Shaman Performer, is to inspire and empower. What do you think, Art? <laughs> Art, wake up. Oh, are you there? I'm just, I'm just, I'm just kind of sat here blown away by what you're saying, Craig. I mean, <clears throat> you've kind of really just summed it all up perfectly, better than anyone else could put it, really. I don't think I can add anything to that. Well, here, then, uh, we... Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that was uh, maybe you can answer this. Uh, and this is Sean McCarthy asking, uh, what do you, uh, either of you uh, think is the causes of the sudden increase in popularity in urban shamanism? I know Craig kind of touched on that a little bit, but it was that he touched on it and less of why and that more of that it exists. Um, he goes on to ask, uh, where do you feel the movement is going? Well, I'm pleased that it's getting more popular because I think it's such a uh, different and unique kind of magic that's not really been focused on too much before. I mean, obviously, like Craig said, it's been going quite a long time, and in all honesty, it's been going back thousands and thousands of years when people were doing it for real. And <clears throat> the fact that more people are getting into it is fantastic. Where I see it going, I have no idea. I thought last year that I discovered every single you know, trick that evolved in, um, in elemental work, and I'm constantly updating the, uh, the book that me and Craig are working on. It's just new things are appearing every day that we can take advantage of and make it seem like we're doing, because obviously there's always a method involved. I think it's going somewhere really, really fantastic, and I want it to become more popular with the public as well, definitely. Craig? Um, <clears throat> this is a tough one to answer uh, in some ways. The, uh, the idea, the terminology of Urban Shaman actually gets its roots from a book called Urban Shaman uh, that came out of an earth religion uh, group, <coughs> New Age group. <coughs> oh, sorry. You dying. Cop it up a line. Um, the the original idea behind it was living as a um, conventional shaman in modern society and how distanced we are from nature in today's world. And I think that because art reflects uh, the social attitudes that the rise of Urban Shaman as a performance style uh, stems from the public's hunger 
to reconnect with the earth, to reconnect with nature and the human spirit. Um, the more we look at society, I know in the U.S. and in the U.K. in particular, the more almost exactly divided it is. You've got people that are ardently secular and very scientific and logic-oriented that are constantly butting heads with those that aren't, with those that have faith of some form. Um, I think this has created a rift uh, on, on many levels. Uh, and I think that those that are stuck in, in between those two worlds are looking for something to connect to. Um, now, my approach is a little bit different from a lot of other people's, but Stuart Palm does the same thing, is we demonstrate what's possible or plausible. And do so in a way to help people become empowered. We don't want them to be codependent. We're not out to become gurus. It's very easy to do, as anybody that's been involved with mentalism uh, should know. It's very easy to get people to believe that you are something more than what you are. But our goal isn't so much to become <clears throat> guru as it is guide. <clears throat> um, even uh, uh, David Blaine, when he does the things he does, he tries to present it in a manner that's enchanting, all inspiring, but his delivery is done in such a way of this is magic that's inside of you, and this is magic that surrounds us. And he, he helps rekindle that enchantment that so many of us nowadays lose by the time we're nine or ten years old. We're not. We're we're robbed of our innocence because of the way society is driven. Right, and you know, I think that that this is something we've uh, talked about personally a few times, which is, you know, it's okay to be um, to be somewhat um, skeptical. You can be skeptical of things. That just means you're questioning what's around you. But to be cynical isn't okay. You're immediately discounting things without even trying to discover and trying to make it make sense to you. And I think that that's something, and that's something I have experience in, in that I came from a very logical household. I don't have a religion. Um, I lost my religion at a very young age. And magic in the form of magic in my head was really lost at that point. And it wasn't until recently having these discussions uh, with you and with a few other people that I'm realizing that magic isn't exactly what I thought it was. I think that that would be where people are less. I think the people who are arguing against it don't understand it. Is is the idea because a lot of urban shamanism is about helping the person. You're, you're helping the audience in any some way. You're adding to the audience, <clears throat> giving them that something. You're making them better when they leave you. Exactly. Well, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, Craig. Go ahead. Well, yeah. Um, in all of my effects, I'm never the one to, you know, make the cloud vanish or to make the waterfalls fall upwards or anything like that. It's, the emphasis is always put on the spectator, and it's they're the one that those they are the ones who achieve this. So it's it's like I say, it's given them a gift. It's given them something to go home with and tell everyone about and feel great about. It's always given the power to them, in my eyes. So my point of view, and and you and I have talked about this, Alex. I think I've talked with Art about it, but. In my point of view, the idea of magic, as it's known in legend and lore, is a misunderstanding. Because the magicians, the wizards, were very educated. And if you really break down what they did, especially like the alchemists and so forth, they were scientists. They were an early version of scientists. So magic is real. It's just we've changed the, the spelling of it to science. And when you understand it from that point of view and perhaps widen it just a little bit because of faith and uh, 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 I'm trying to think of the word I want to use, uh, anecdotal circumstance, 
you know, the miraculous does happen. Even in a scientific laboratory, there's the unknown uh, factor that can cause an experiment to change. Even though you're doing these exact same steps, the experiment results can change. And that can be everything from barometric pressure to magnetic influences, um, just your, your, your attitude and how you approach it can all affect it. So, you know, on one level, from the paranormal point of view, we're looking at it as very extremely fine energy that we cannot yet measure somehow influences certain results. But we can also look at, you know, there's more dense energy, such as we use for cloud busting or, um, you know, ideomotor type effects. Those are things that are tangible, which just 100 years ago, you know, muscle reading was considered miraculous and real. Um, even to this day, theosophist groups and spiritualists look at muscle reading as being contact mind reading and one of the preliminaries towards developing telepathy. And the irony is, is that physicists and mod other aspects of modern science have stated telepathy will probably be the first major paranormal ability that science proves. You know, the cause of that reality. And look at how much closer we get to it by not just body language, but techniques like uh, facial action coding and how to read finite movements in the face and in the other parts of the body, how to read the body structure and facial structures. That's I think, really close. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you, uh, I think you hit the nail, uh, I don't think you could have hit the nail harder on the head. Um, you know, people who talk about magicians from back, you know, from wizards and whatnot, are from the people who their perspective of the audience. Of course, they look like magicians. They're 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 performing these miraculous things, and they know more than you. And that's really all a magician is: is I'm doing something that I know more than you about, and you you feel as though it's magic because you don't know how it works. Um, and that's that that happens uh, all the time. And I think that's because people as uh, as people they reason from analogy as opposed to reasoning from base principles. So they're not looking at it as, well, this, 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 and this. They're looking at it, well, I do this, and this is what I know, so this is what I'm comparing it to. And you can't look at everything like that. It's a, you almost have to look at it from an engineering uh, point of view, which is let's take everything else, that, forget everything you know, let's start learning this. Well, a great example is something that an experience you and I shared recently, Alex, was I had problems with a simple computer situation. Well, what you did was magical because you know how to make it work. I don't. Um, and people kind of take magic out of context. They don't realize that you're initiated in a field. You're studied in a field that I'm totally ignorant of. So from my point of view, you can create miracles that I am ignorant of. Uh, but similarly, I can create miracles that you're ignorant of. Um, you know, we all have our pluses and negatives uh, when it comes to knowledge and ability. And did we lose you or something? Art? No, I'm good. No, the, Art. the screen blacked out for a second. Oh, no, I'm still here. Okay. Okay, Art. Yeah, I'm here. Your turn. <laughs> Um, I must admit, I was a bit distracted there. I was just reading the email. What were we talking about? I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, we were talking about um, we were talking about how people take magic out of context. It's all right. Um, we we're talking about how magic people take magic out of context. You know, people from you know, as wizards are described, it was from the the layperson perspective. Of course, it's going to look like wizardry. No, it's they they have no idea what's going on. Um, Craig brought up the example uh, that, you know, I mean, I did something for him. I fixed his computer um, from three, four, five, whatever, how many thousand miles away um, across the, the country. That's magic now. You know, he had no idea what I did and how to do it. I did. And I was able to speak 
because uh, because of that, it seemed like magic. And like Craig knows about, because he's very well studied in his fields, that would seem like magic to me, because I don't know how they work. Um, and I couldn't even begin to. What brought up that is that uh, people's problem with spiritualism and whatnot is that they reason by analogy because they're logical. And you think that that would be the smart thing. Well, you know, I have all this knowledge. Let's confuse it as the basis of comparison. When there's a lots of things where you have to go back and take a look at things and start reasoning from base principles. So that was kind of a quick gist. Awesome. Fair enough. <laughs> um, one of the things that segregate the urban shaman from the traditional magician are the props that we use. And I don't know how well this can be seen, but... This is my lootable. It's an actual clay pot, and um, all of a sudden my mind went blank as to who I got it from. <laughs> they used to be sold through Martin Breezy. Um, but I did the painting and everything to make it look like Native American. Um, the idea uh, behind that disguise is because I use it in a um, story that was written by Barry Tolmich about a drought and a medicine man and how he created water. And there's only three different pores done with it. But it's the story and the message of faith and how the gods answered prayer. Um, I've got another routine that's similar that deals with a um, Greek farmer and he couldn't raise his crops because of the drought. And um, Persephone comes in to play, and she blesses his seed, and it overflows all our rice bowls, and then guarantees that there would be plenty of water, uh, which, again, you've got the Loda type aspect that you find in rice bowls. I've got another couple of things that I've added into it, including a long rice pour, similar to the long salt pour, um, <clears throat> which it makes it creates enchantment, it creates impossibility because here I'm producing a half a pound of rice from nowhere, and the audience when I'm doing this in my um, robes out in, uh, on the streets. You know, it, it seems completely impossible because I'm not doing it on a controlled stage or something. I'm doing this in a little city park, and I'm surrounded by trees and grass. There's no way for me to, quote-unquote, cheat on that high of a level. Um, another example is um, Danny Walren. Uh, most people know him as Special Head from America's Got Talent. And his... his um, fuck your suspension. You know, he walks out and just jumps into the air and he's floating in the air holding on to this staff. It's mind-blowing, especially for magicians who know know how it works and know that he has redesigned that concept and made it portable and practical. Um, now, there's been a lot of invitations to what he does, but None of them are creating that intrigue of being the living, breathing wizard that can um, literally do the impossible right in the middle of the street, as it were. Uh, I mean, obviously, there are certain things that you have to do mechanically, but you know, it still comes off as improvisational or impromptu uh, when it's staged right. And that's the real goal, is um, being able to create, I think Vernon's story about the sandwiches is the best analogy. Um, if you produce a chicken sandwich just to produce a chicken sandwich, it's a neat trick. But if you're walking by a homeless guy that needs food and you produce a chicken sandwich, you just created a miracle. And right. That, that's what we strive to do, is to work in that position. Um, Absolutely. Uh, and yeah, I, we, lost, uh, we lost Art, by the way. I just wanted to let you know. Uh, it's just I, for the time being. <laughs> wasn't sure what happened there. Anyway, go ahead and continue. I just want to let you know. Um, I have actually done things with homeless people where I've produced uh, 
money, drinks, and food uh, in a magical way for them. And, you know, so a couple of them in the area call me Merlin when I go by because of it. But they also know that I don't do it all the time. And I only do it when I see people that are working progressively forward with their life. Uh, in other words, I'm not going to do it for an active junkie. But if it's a junkie that is trying to straighten up his life, or her life as one case is, then I'm glad to do it. You know, it's worth the six bucks for the sandwich. And there, <clears throat> people talk about the expression that people have when they see magic, especially little kids. Well, you will see that little kid come to life in a 50-year-old face when you do this kind of thing. And that is the payoff. Um, urban shamanism isn't a big money maker. Uh, it is a thing that you literally do from your soul, um, which which kind of goes against the way our society teaches us to do things, especially when you're talking on the forums of how do I get gigs, how do I, you know, how much do I charge, all this type of stuff. Well, urban shamanism, it, it goes back to even before the time of Jesus, where, you know, the, the, the monks took alms and, you know, tithes from, from the poor. And sometimes uh, one of the parables around Jesus is the tithe given by the poor woman was of greater value and greater import than the big chunk of money given by the rich man. As a rich man does it for the sake of ego and showing off, where the poor person doesn't. They do it out of gratitude. Right. You know, um, there's uh, something you pointed out now a couple of times that I wanted to kind of jump in on. Um, and it was the difference, really the difference that ur urban shamanism, uh, how urban, uh, urban shamanism uh, stands apart from other forms of magic and mentalism. And I think that... Um, to say framing is almost kind of, it's not quite the right word because it almost takes away from what you're doing. Um, but a lot of it is in exactly how you present uh, yourself and what you're doing. And I feel that um, in anything you do, uh, your pretense is so strongly affects uh, your attitude in general and, and how things present and how really really how things are perceived. You're right. You're right. Um, one of the things that people hear me say a lot is that a mentalist only does one trick. He uses a lot of effects in order to create an image around himself or herself that says, I am this person. I am special in this way. You know, it might be intellectually, it might be under the guise of being a psychic or even a witch or whatever, but everything you do builds on that claim. So as an urban shaman, a lot of what I do is sit in a park and just talk to people and tell stories. Uh, I mean, exactly like the old mystics used to do, is you sit down and you tell parables and you know, Aesop's fables and stuff like that in order to convey old school wisdom, uh, an old school connection with with people. Uh, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier is the public's desire to... Is that Morgan just jumped on. Hey, what's uh, going on, guys? Welcome to the party. Hey, how's it going? All right, how you doing, bud? Man, hanging in there, hanging in there. Sorry I'm late. That's okay. Y'all ready to talk about some urban shamanism? I've been doing it for a while now. <laughs> I know, I'm so late. I'm so sorry. I was taking care of my mom, and like I, I take care of her weekly, and I thought it was on Tuesday. Uh -huh. I've just got so much stuff going on. I'm so sorry I'm late, guys. I want to apologize. How's it going, uh -huh. Craig? It's going good. 
It's not a problem, Morgan. Uh, we were uh, we were just talking. Uh, we had touched on a, f- on a few different things, but uh, Craig was just commenting on uh, how uh, uh, really how the pretense of uh, urban shamanism affects uh, how it's perceived. You know, first of all, I think it's a, a really new type of groundbreaking thing. And, like, I personally, me and Craig were actually talking about this, I don't believe in disclaimers at all. Um, I think that if you're going to play the role of urban shamanism or something like that, you really don't want to play the disclaimer role. And I think Jerome Finley was literally a pioneer and in, in really set the bar for a lot of the stuff for urban shamanism. And you know what? I think he's just, if you haven't checked out his material, I mean, I would definitely check it out because he's really been an influence on me in that particular role. Um, And I I think that it's just, I mean, it's, it's an amazing concept in like art form and it's just so fun to do. And I mean, once you get into it and you actually start doing it, it's not even almost like magic anymore. It's just it's it's so real, you know, and you can touch people's lives in a way that you can't do with regular magic. And that's exactly the point I think uh, Craig was making right then was uh, not so much disclaimers, which we'll get to here shortly. We haven't quite gotten to disclaimers yet, um, but uh, the pretense, uh, your own pretense going in as a performer, how you perceive what you're doing and. Um, how how much of it you believe in, and you know what you actually what your intent is, regardless of how you end up acting. I think that pretense um, is so important in how other people see what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I literally, um, when I, perform, I believe in my character. You know, absolutely. Um, and you, you kind of have to. I mean, it's just like uh, it's it's very much like. Uh, it's just really old, uh, really old taught. If you, if you go through, the coin's in there in my head. I mean, we all know the coin's in this hand, but in my head, the coin is right there. Because if the coin is right there in my head, the coin is right there in their head. How can they do believe what you, I'm doing it? I don't believe it. Yeah, well, I'll tell you something funny. If you do that, if you want to fool a magician, actually put the coin, don't do anything, and put the coin in that hand, and you'll fool magicians. <laughs> do that and just do that. Like, literally take it and then open your hand, it'll fool a magician. Oh, man. I'm serious. I used to do it all the time at conventions and mess with people. (laughs) That's great, man. Anywho, so, uh, Craig, uh, do do you remember the point you were making right at that point, or do you want to move on? Um, I've lost track, actually. (laughs) (laughs) That that happens. Um, All right. Well, we can move back uh, into some questions. And, uh, we have some racking up right now. Um, now that I got a couple of you back on, um, I do have some Morgan uh, particular questions. But uh, one I kind of liked was, uh, um, well, and since uh, it was already touched on by Morgan, uh, do you use any disclaimers uh, in any of your performances? And uh, more importantly, uh, what are your own ethics in performing for real? And those are questions in one thread by Sean McCarthy. Okay. You go first, Craig Morgan. Um, There's Craig. I I loathe the idea of a disclaimer. Um, the psychology going to minimalism. The psychology of minimalism is the creation of something real. Um, when you up front before the show begins says everything you're seeing is going to be a trick you kind of defeat the psychology of presenting something that invokes belief um, <clears throat> Stephen Minch in one of his early writings points out that the the mentalist has one foot in the world of theater and one foot firmly planted in the world of charlatan and the urban shaman is very similar. Uh, we walk a very thin line between the two. Um, the the difference, and we were talking about this before we started the lecture, is that we don't encourage codependence. Um, we don't want people to make us their guru. Uh, we're not out to build a cult following. What we want to do is empower the individual and teach them that they have the ability within themselves to to move mountains if they want to. 
Um, and I think that's very important. Uh, magicians are too timid. They're afraid of maximizing what they can do with magic. And a lot of it has to do with all the naysayers out there and the persecution that we've seen for decades now. So, Morgan? You know, I think uh, Craig and I are going to eventually get bashed for this because I know a lot of magicians and mentalists believe in disclaimers and this, things like that. But I really literally think that if you give a disclaimer, everything that you're about to do in the mentalism or uh, urban shamanism genre is going to be ruined personally, just my opinion, and I agree with Craig 100%. If you give a disclaimer, I mean, it almost discredits what you're about to do, and it makes mentalism magic, which mentalism is very different than magic. And the thing I try to invoke is, even though my character is very, very real, I'm, I, I just put out a very, very controversial book uh, called Ice Cold, and even Craig told me that it was controversial and some things needed to be written because it's it's so controversial in ways. Now the thing about it is though, I, whenever I'm doing readings or something like that, it's very real and it's very touching and I have people often cry and stuff like that, but I comfort them. And it's all about how you connect with the audience and how you make them feel. A lot of times when you're given readings and stuff like that, people just wanna, they, they need somebody to talk to. And a lot of times, I'll give a reading, and I'll just sit there and listen to them. And they'll think it was the best reading ever, and all I did was listen to them. Because a lot of times, people don't have anybody to talk to, and they just want to get stuff off of their chest, you know? And the thing is, 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 you know, and a lot of times, you can take that information, and you can repackage it to them, and they don't even remember that they said it. And, you know, I think whether it's cold reading or you know metal bending or anything like Uri Geller was a pioneer in that. Look at what Uri Geller did. I mean, he literally had, like, I mean, he's a perfect example of it. And I think he was um, the first one to really, like, uh, in my opinion, sell it in a way to where, I mean, the general public was like, oh, my God, this phenomenon exists. You know what I mean? And the thing is, is, is I, he's, a, he's a huge inspiration to me, and so is Craig, actually. I mean, Craig is, you know, in my opinion – like one of the best at what he does and he actually just wrote a chapter on numerology in my book that's going to come out and the extra PDF will come out to everybody who bought it but it's amazing and it, just his thoughts on cold reading and, and mentalism in general are just amazing and I know he's got a book coming out and you've got to buy it I mean it's, it's going to be earth shattering because he's told me some of the material in it and it's just it's going to be phenomenal and you know um I, I personally, again, don't believe in the disclaimer. Just to sum it up, and I, I think that if you give one, it makes it more magic-y. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with magic and stuff like that, but it's all what you're trying to portray. And the thing is, is I want people to realize that I'm not saying that I'm a counselor or anything like that. And you can take it too far, and I don't think you want people to put you on this pedestal of, like, he's a, a god or, you know, you want to start a religion or anything like that. But, you you know, just, you know, sell it and, you know, but don't go too far because I think there is a line. Don't you agree, Craig? Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> I had to get away for a minute um, trying to find out what happened to Art. Um, I understand the, the reason some acts want to use a disclaimer. and I do. Yeah, if you're doing a theatrical type program, that's fine. Um, when you work the type of markets that I work the most, um, it's not fine. Uh, one, you won't work. <laughs> if, if you're admitting to being a fraud, they're not going to book you. Um, and unfortunately, with my situation, I can't work uh, traveling and, and working theaters and so forth anymore. So, you know, I, my, I have a strange philosophy when it comes to the idea of a big disclaimer, and that is 
Um, for an example, I'm putting together a seance program for next year uh, with our local historic society. We are calling it a reenactment on purpose. And that's as much of a disclaimer as exists around it. Everything else that happens as far as the, the public's perception and experience is exactly the way it was done a hundred years ago uh, when the spiritualist movement was so big in this area. Um, we're tying in local legend and all this other stuff. There's an educational edge to it. And by saying that it's an enactment and then knowing that I'm using techniques that were used by frauds and so forth does not take away from what I'm doing. They still have a very believable experience. They still have things that they're going to encounter that they don't know how to digest. Because we're mixing my history, my ties to the local New Age pagan community and stuff like that, which makes them uncertain as to what's a trick and what's not a trick. And I deliberately throw a couple things in that obviously are tricks, just for the sake of entertainment. Right, and I think uh, even though I do use a disclaimer when I work, um, it's funny because I do use a disclaimer, <laughs> but it's not like at the beginning of the show I go and say, hey, well, you know, this is, you know, this is all fake. <laughs> Um, part of my character, part of my bit is uh, I'm horribly self-deprecating. I call myself a piece of shit. I call myself worthless carny trash. Like anything and everything <laughs> I can to like, you know. Uh, so that, which, by the way, gives me great opportunity when I do mess up to just vamp on that for a second and move on. Um, but I think because I mix a lot of things, it, some things that I do that are obviously sleight of hand. And something, a lot of things uh, that I like to do happen in your mind or your hands or or whatever. You're you're in control of the decision, right? Um, and when you even, it doesn't matter how much I say that I'm I'm a cheat and a liar. When you're decide making all the decisions and you're making you know things are happening in your hands, you're still not going to be able to explain it. And I think that's where I kind of get people is because I'm constantly saying those things. That is almost like it obviously can't be true, if that makes sense. Well, Banachek will tell you about people that come to him after a show, and they kind of wink at him and say, we understand why you have to say that you're fake because of the way the legal system works and everybody's so sue happy and all this other stuff. But they still reject the idea that he's a fraud because they just watched him do amazing things. Um, there are ways of wording it. Banachek's disclaimer skirts around a lot of issues. And it works for him. It works for a lot of people. It's just, for me, it doesn't make sense. And it doesn't um, create a, a optimal uh, uh, results for how I approach what I do. Now, you know uh, what? Can I make a comment about your new project, Craig? What's that? Um, you know how the, you have the murder mystery thing, like the, the, the thing with the book that you're offering for people? Yes. Um, I, I just wanted to comment on that because it kind of relates to the subject a little bit. And every day I get a post on, on Facebook or an email of people asking me, how do you break into the magic world? How do you, you know, you know get your products published? How do you do this? And, and stuff like that. And I think what you're doing is you're giving a great opportunity to someone that doesn't have anything published that's wanting to build a name in this community an opportunity to do so with this book because it's being published through sense of big company and I think what you could do, I mean literally I think people need to take an, a real serious thought about this and really try to really try to work out the details on it um, and submit information for this book because it could really help cement their name in the mentalism world and and you know this book's gonna live on forever I mean DVDs will come and go because VHS same thing but a book will last forever and the thing is it'll cement their legacy and you know mentalism and I think that people really need to you know send you information because I was a little frustrated when I seen your post and didn't see any comments and I think you're just offering such a wonderful opportunity to people to break into the field. Well, thanks. 
I'll, I was going to uh, jump in. I'll be perfectly honest, and I, uh, I've, uh, we, me and Craig talked about this a little bit, but I've talked with others uh, on this subject, and a lot of people don't feel that their material is worthy of such high accolades that they submit it. To be perfectly honest, and that's 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 unfortunately part of the problem right now is you're, it's a great opportunity, but I think people realize it's a great opportunity, and it's not something that they want to uh, go into half-heartedly. I have had well, one person in particular uh, sent me a synopsis of what he had in mind, and I'm like, "This is dynamite! Write it up." He did. He was selling himself short. Um, uh, Morgan and I were talking yesterday, and I, I, you, you kind of teased me about being the grumpy old bear, and I think that that is part of the the problem is that people are intimidated by me and they think I'm going to be overly critical. But sometimes the simplest ideas and, and stuff that comes from a complete novice ends up being better than stuff that comes from uh, Arden Pro. So, um, you know, I'm always interested in seeing what people have to offer. I've been blown away by total nobodies. Uh, in fact, the book Urban Shamanism that Art and I are working on, um, it's coming out next spring. We've got two or three routines in it that were offered by total novices. They're just beautiful concepts. One's a sleight of hand routine working with stones. That's just beautiful. It's simple, it's basic, but the manner of how it's presented is, is beautiful material. Um, and that's the other thing on the Urban Shaman is uh, a lot of us are working with um, natural items, stones, sticks, uh, sand, and so forth, uh, as um, the, the tools that we use. But if you're in an urban situation, a metropolitan situation, that includes the things that you find laying around all the time. It can be bottle caps. It can be, you know, pencils. You know, anything that's within your environment can be incorporated. Um, think of uh, the primary elements, earth, air, fire, water, metal, wood. Um, work with those elements. Look at ways of using those elements and tying them into a more mystical story. Uh, it can be a parable. It can be a ritual, as you would find in bizarre magic. Um, uh, on, on the Urban Shamanism forum, uh, Alain Nu just came up with a wonderful thread about working with the little voodoo doll. You know, the little straw doll that races up in your hand. And we've gotten some beautiful ideas working with something that elementary. You know, a $6 trick that most people just look at, play with for a couple of minutes, and then throw away. You've got some of the biggest names out there playing with it and saying, oh, but you can do this and this, and this will be really cool. I'm going to put this in my show. Now, when you've got major players out there saying that, then it gives you reason to look at simplicity, uh, whether it's you know with the urban shaman side or traditional magic. Uh, I mean, uh, traditional magic-wise, look at the stuff Eugene Berger's put out. A lot of it is very elementary. And it's it's powerful stuff when you present it right. So you don't have to run out and get the latest fifty dollar, seventy five dollar thing out there. Um, you know, learn the basics of magic and learn how to present magic. Yeah, everything else is just a toy. To be perfectly yeah. honest, really, I mean, after after you learn principles and basics, everything else is just a neat little toy uh, to to put up on your wall. You know, um, that's that's pretty much it. Um, there was uh, I just got a message in from uh, Bill Montana. Uh, he was uh, saying he just told me that he's really enjoying the lecture and he wanted to offer up uh, the bridge, his book, the bridge, a signed copy cool. to uh, somebody uh, as part of the contest. So towards the uh, end, uh, we'll go ahead and give that away. But uh, yay, Bill! Hey, Bill. I uh, the bridge is one of my favorite bits. I use it. A lot with, with private clients when I'm doing readings. Uh, I've got a show in which I have combined the bridge with something else, 
and it's part of a uh, closing meditation to the show where I do an actual guided meditation with the audience. And <clears throat> the part that's very neat is that they're given something that's totally intangible, but if they go through the little ritual that I've walked them through, they end up with a miraculous within their own experience and their own dream world. Uh, the bridge is a very powerful tool. I, I recommend it to anyone that does urban shamanism and does readings. I, yeah, uh, I was lucky enough to get my hands on a copy myself uh, after re reading through it a couple of times. I mean, anybody who isn't into the idea that you might be able to play with other people's dreams, I mean, walk away. But, like, beyond that, like, there is so much good information if you're just willing to look at it, listen, and try it out. You're just willing to try it. I was about to say, I think Morgan's falling asleep, but he's back. Well, actually, I have some Morgan, uh, I have some Morgan questions. Morgan, would you like some questions that are... Yeah, I love them. I love them. Um, uh, Christophe Ludrian said for Morgan Strebler, can you bend something without preparation? Actually, I can, um, and at the end of the show, I'll bend everybody's silverware at home, if you'd like. I mean, if they're interested, take a vote of how many want to stick around, and I'll bend the silverware in their homes. Sweet. Um, he also asked uh, for you, uh, why do you love to perform uh, spoon and fork bending so much? You know what? Um, for me, it's it's it's... Okay, this goes kind of back to what Craig said. Uh, a complete unknown can give an idea, and it can skyrocket them. Liquid Metal was the first thing that I put out or released in the Magic community, and unfortunately, I'll probably never be able to top it, and it's <laughs> kind of cemented my name with metal bending. And for me, metal bending is just... It's one of the most amazing, like things that you can do to someone because the thing is is especially when you borrow a key or a coin from them or they have silverware at their house and you can bend it it's it's almost like real magic like it's not even magic anymore it's just real and it's it's such a beautiful thing to do and i mean that's what i'm talking about good job that's a great corkscrew by the way <laughs> But no, I mean, metal bending for me, honestly, it it, uh, it come in, I mean, I, I started with it, and now people expect it, so I do it in every show. I mean, I've done the routine probably 60,000 times, literally, um, just by the count case of forks that I bought over the years. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, you know, I'm, I, I do get tired of performing it, but people love it, and you, I think even though I'm tired of doing it, you have to perform it still the same way every time with the same enthusiasm and the same uh, you know drive and ambition as I did it the first time because these people have never seen what I do and you know I, it's for me metal bending is you know what made me and you know I I, I, I love it well you know and it's it's hard because I mean you hit it right on the head you know it's it may be their first time, it may be your millionth time, but it's their first time seeing this thing. And, uh, you know, if you want people to love it like they did the first time, you have to love it like you did the first time, to some extent. That's uh, That goes back to that uh, whole pretense thing, though, I think. Yeah, I agree. And, I mean, it's just such a, a beautiful art form. And when I was creating it, a lot of people, you know, a lot of mentalists uh, don't agree with my approach to bending. But, in my opinion... I have a different philosophy, and I think it's you know it's valid as well, because if you truly had this gift, would you put one bin in a spoon, or if you really had this gift, would you demolish the hell out of the fork or spoon? You know what I'm saying? And for me, they forget the steps in liquid from how it got to where it was, and you hear stories. Oh, the thing just went like this, and it started bending like crazy, and I mean they they. They don't remember what happened, and they're, the way they describe it is is totally different than what happened. And I just thought that if you really had this gift and could really do it, 
you wouldn't put one bin to one then grab another one and then you know do it like that you would just demolish it and that was my take on metal bending right you know and I I really 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 liked uh, that whole that whole series um, uh, everything you do is just I mean all the moves everything one at a time it just it, it projects this demolishing uh, atmosphere within within the fork and which is something that I had thought about when I had first started metal bending in the first place, which is like I take out one fork and then we start moving. You know, I'll start with tines and start playing with that. I'll do just a tine droop or something along those lines and move on. And then I'll move into a spot where I can demolish the thing and then hand it. And then that's it. That's the performance. We have one fork, a whole lot of fun, and and then that's it. Um, having to carry around that much silverware is stressful. <laughs> You know what? And they got holders now for it and stuff like that. You don't know how many jackets I have ripped from silverware. Like almost every like dress coat or whatever I have has holes in it. I mean, I have. I mean, and you got to be careful too. I mean, if you you could look at my hands up close, like you would see scars, like literal scars from where I've cut myself taking the silverware out of my pocket and stuff. I mean, it's just. And I, I usually carry, when I'm doing walk around, 40 or 50 at a time. And, you know, because once I do it, everybody wants to see it. And it's just kind of like, okay, I'm getting booked to perform liquid, you know? And it's kind of weird because I have so much other material that I'd rather do that I think is just as strong. I mean, I've got, like, a lot of new projects coming out. I can't really talk about them, but I have a lot of new stuff already shot in the can. And I think people are going to be super excited about it because it's some really, really cool and different things that you haven't seen from me. And I've also got um, – uh, it's just a different take on what you know from the past Morgan. And there's going to be a lot of new stuff in the really near future that's going to, I think, blow people's minds. And I, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and it's – you know, I do have – some metal bending thoughts. I've actually started working on a new routine that's completely different than liquid from the ground up, and it's it's a hundred percent different. There's, I mean, it's no resemblance to liquid at all, and I mean, I'm I'm trying to figure out how how can you top what you've already done, and I've been working on it for close to a year, and it's it's just, I mean, it's it's very very hard to top liquid for me personally. And I know other people, you know, there's other vendors out there that are, you know, better than me. But for me personally, it's my goal to try to top that routine and, and put something fresh out that's new. All right. Well, and let's, then let's uh, take and switch uh, from metal bending. Uh, we had kind of touched on this a little bit. Uh, let's talk about cold reading for a second. Um, Andy Hoffer was writing in and asked, uh, can you each describe how you use cold reading and uh, in what setting? Um, Craig, you want to go first? Okay. Um, first of all, I don't believe in cold reading. Um, the theories that are out there are just that. They're not based on, on actual experience in most cases. Um, and they all lean on one psychological set of tests from 50 years ago. Um, cold reading technically means the first time you've ever met somebody and you walk in and do a reading, which is usually a personality profile. Um, now, when I usually meet somebody, I'm sizing them up. I'm, I'm gathering uh, a ton of information. Would you sit still? Um, I'm gathering a ton of information from how they walk, how they move, um, and of course, within their name, um, I believe that it's important to have a system other than the oracle you're working with. Um, a lot of the work that I do, I use tarot in conjunction with numerology, but the system behind it all is psychometry from A to Z, Richard Webster. Uh, Neil Scryer talks a lot about doing this. Um, but the basic idea behind the four year concept uh, I think is a little bit stretching the issue. Um, 
because everything does have a positive and negative. That's just natural. Every tarot card has an upside and a downside. And that's the way you're going to end up reading them. Um, the other side that people forget is that you are reading the cards. It's literally a language that you're uh, translating and developing a storyline to. And hopefully you're cultivating a relationship with your sitter in such a way to where it uh, connects with them and helps them through whatever it is that they're doing. If I'm not uh, mistaken, Craig, didn't the Catholic Church actually use tarot at one time to uh, try to contact light or, you know, divine information from Jesus? Uh, the tarot was used to teach the Gospels. The, the yeah. Baby, you know. um, but it became taboo when the... Um, Mediums. During the whole chaos around the uh, Knights Templar, it kind of became taboo because it was a tool used by the Knights. <clears throat> um, there's still a lot of people within the Catholic community, especially Hispanic community, that still rely on tarot. Um, but they still rely on, on bibliomancy in the sense of uh, scripture and so forth. Um, the one thing I wanted to touch on, two things I wanted to touch on before I turned it over to you, Morgan, is um, first of all, Barnum statements. Everybody that does readings gets into the habit of using certain cliche lines. It just it happens out of, out of repetition. Uh, when you get lost or a thought, or when a circumstance is familiar to uh, a given issue that a client's using, you might repeat yourself uh, by using a common set of phrases or references. Uh, the other thing that people tend to forget is that there's a big difference between doing readings for an individual and doing a Q&A. When you're doing readings from stage, you can get away with one-line responses and canned responses are far easier than you can when you're doing one-on-one -on -one readings. So with that, I'll let Morgan talk. <clears throat> um, for me, readings, uh, when I perform them, I, I, I tend to go a little far, I think, uh, with the, the spectator. And my system is based on basically a no-miss system that has like multiple facets to it and I think I brought something a little bit new to cold reading and I mean at least from uh, it's but it's controversial and the thing is this it's all how first of all I, I size up everybody and I same as Craig as soon as I meet them and I look at how they walk how they talk how they you know their posture their you know multiple things uh, um, you you can also see if they're uncomfortable by you know if they're blinking or something like that. So I move away from stuff if they're you know, or if they're you know put their head down or just different things that cue you. And what he said with Barnum statements is actually correct. I mean, it, it, the thing is is here Peter Turner described it best. Barnum statements are like a pair of shoes. You can never have too many in your arsenal. And the thing is, is it's you have a different pair of shoes for every occasion. Now the thing is, is if you're performing cold reading for, let's say, you know, a 70-year-old person, you obviously wouldn't give the same reading that you would for a 20-year-old person. So you, you know, if something wasn't going right in the reading, you could pull out that stock line and you know make it hit. Now the thing is, is I cold reading is truly, in my opinion something you could do behind a wall to somebody and never touch them or anything like that. That's true cold reading in my opinion. Um, I think that, you know, when you see them and you can analyze them and stuff like that, um, and me and Peter agree on this a little bit, you know, uh, I mean, we have a lot of the same thoughts on it. It's almost like a warm read because you still get to see them and have contact with them and you can size them up. A true cold read 
is something where, in my opinion, you never actually, like, it would be behind a wall or over the phone or something like that, and you're just going by intuition. And I believe intuition plays a big part in code reading, and it's a skill like every other skill, whether it be sleight of hand or, you know, something like that. And I believe you can peak your intuition. Um, I don't know what Craig thinks about intuition, but I, I really think you can peak that intuition and, and really start giving amazing readings just based off of, you know, your gut instinct and what you feel. Yeah, and intuition is very important. Um, I mean, yes, I, I support having a system and so forth, but learning how to listen to your gut is vital when it comes to doing readings. Um you mentioned something else, and now my mind is um, listening to the gut. Um, well, wasn't meant to be shared. Uh, <laughs> um, um, you know, being a reader is is a special thing, and not everybody has the gift. But I've also found that a lot of people in magic get afraid of it because they are good at it. Um, I've seen that with muscle reading too. They just they get paranoid because it's so real, and they can't explain it away logically. Um, uh, well, I think a lot of people, Craig, wouldn't you agree that once your intuition kicks in and you start getting so many crazy hits, I think some people actually believe that they really do have this gift. Well, I think there's a truth to that, and it's a valid truth. Uh, when you start turning off the intellectual side and things happen by, as second nature, uh, when you actually are sensing things with your gut, and you know, I've had situations where something happens, a smell or something triggers me, and it makes absolutely no sense, but I have to go with that information. And I share it with the, the sitter, and they flip out because it's got a direct connection. Uh, when you learn how to trust those type of circumstances, I think that you're heading down the path of what uh, most people refer to as being psychic. Uh, if you look at the background and the purpose behind things like runes and tarot cards and so forth, it's to help you get in touch with that side of yourself um, using an intellectual tool and system. The more you work it, the more in tune you become to the person sitting across from you. Some of us, after we've worked it for a period of time, we're able to walk straight in on people cold from a stage or whatever. Um, I've had people, magicians, completely blown away that I was able to walk in and pinpoint key things in their lives or the life of their wife or whatever the, the case might be without any inside scoop. And they don't, they don't want to believe that it was just based on intuition. But that's the only explanation. Yeah, I mean, I think almost intuition is like a sixth sense, literally. I mean, in my opinion, I mean, it's it's not technically labeled as a sixth sense, but I think intuition can be peaked to almost a sixth sense. Wouldn't you agree? Definitely. Definitely. Uh, in fact, you'll find people in the psychic industry that they reach a point of sensitivity that they get overwhelmed and they have to get away from people. They move further outside of town, they become more remote, they're not involved with things socially as much because they've become so hypersensitive that they pick up on this energy from everybody around them. And it's especially if they're empathic, they get uncontrollable emotions. And, and it's difficult. I agree with you 100% on that. And I, and I know he was asking the second fold to the question was, where do you perform code reading? I actually do it for everybody I meet. I mean, yeah. if I come in contact with somebody, I always give them a reading. And I think an oracle is very important when delivering a reading. I think you should either do tarot or palms or runes or you know numerology or something. I think it adds credibility to the reading because I have particularly creepy eyes. And if I just walk up and start giving someone a reading and tell them about their self without an oracle, then they kind of get really creeped out by me. But if I say, you know, can I see your hand? Have you ever had a palm reading before? 
for. It's a little bit different. And I think an oracle is vital to it because it adds that uh, sense of realism to it. Do you agree? Well, the other side of using an oracle is it gives you an out. Yeah. If you if you kind of hit or you have a total miss, you apologize and say, well, it's my misunderstanding of what the oracle is trying to explain. And then you can backtrack and, and weave in and say, oh, here it is. This is what I'm actually seeing and connect it. <clears throat> and you see what I do with misses in my book as well, didn't you? Um, I honestly don't recall. I, but it's something that uh, I've learned from Herb Dewey and Richard Webster and two or three other people that point that out, point that direction out. Well, and I, I have a quick question just from a personal standpoint because long before I ever did uh, magic and whatnot um, in my youth, I did have good intuition and I used to play mess with people, I guess. It began with messing with people and it turned into doing readings for people, which was really weird for me because I'm going, well, logically there's no way for this to make sense. And I just chalked it up to cold reading in my head and intuition and, and whatever, but um, it would be just placing simply placing my hand on somebody and going, Okay, this is what I'm this is what I'm feeling from you and then like just asking questions and having a conversation and just letting them know what I feel and you know, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong at that point. This is the way I feel about you, and you can tell me the rest. Um, so I've never used an oracle. That's kind of where I came from. Um, and I've heard of, like, different uh, oracles being used and them being labeled as such, but can you actually describe um, the general de definition of an oracle? Well, anything like tarot, um, <clears throat> runes, augums, and things like that are oracles. Um, you also have esoteric sciences like numerology, astrology, uh, even the I Ching technically is an is a esoteric science. Palmistry is an es esoteric science. And the two get confused a lot. Um, <clears throat> mostly because of out of habit, uh, everything's got this manner over it, it's psychic. And um, so it it kind of gets muddled down. Um, what you described that you were doing is true psychic connection. I mean, it, it's it's legit, and you just have a knack for it. Um, you can justify it and try to uh, rationalize it, but I have found, and it sounds like you found yourself, sometimes it's just not a freaking answer. Yeah. <laughs> that was a, that was a, well. That was a lot of the thing was you know I would tell people um, what I would tell people is I was reading their energy, which I thought yeah that's a good excuse. Um, I, I'm this is the energy I'm I'm feeling. It's not so much as seeing as much as feeling, but seeing would be the closest thing to it. And not that I ever actually did, but I just sat there and I thought about that person. If I were that person standing there the way they were, From my they person. are an exact road map of everything they've ever been in their life. A lot of people think it's a scatter plot. They're a road map, and you just have to learn to read the map. You know, If they're standing that way, why would they be standing that way? If they said hello, how did they say hello, and why did they say it that way? And well, I an oracle start... essentially is a road map. Mm -hmm. An oracle is a road map and a guide. And I don't think they're, what you do is particularly wrong when you code read. I think it works great for you, maybe. You know, for me, I need an oracle because, especially with my new character that's about to be unveiled, uh, the phoenix is about to rise on this one. The, the Morgan Stribbler that you've known for the past ten years is about to die. And, like, a new thing has come from the ashes. And, like... It'll be debuted very, very soon. But I'm really excited about that. But what I'm getting at with you is I don't think what you're doing is wrong. I think you're cold reading, and you're doing it, you know, fine. For my character, though, I can't pull that off. So I have to use an oracle. And essentially an oracle is a, is a blueprint, you know. Would you agree, Craig? To some degree. Um, <clears throat> I jokingly refer to tarot cards as cue cards, because I'm doing a lot of what you're talking about, Alex. But to keep on point, I use the cards to kind of guide me and fill in the blanks here and there. Um, 
I can do the same thing using a crystal ball and what I see in the crystal ball. Um, yeah, or, or again, like I said, runes or whatever the case may be. Um, I think that if I were to do it all over again, now keep in mind I've done tarot readings since I was 16, but if I had to do it all over again, if I were teaching somebody from scratch, the first oracle or system I would have them study outside of numerology is palmistry. Because 99% of the people you meet have at least one hand. And um, next to that, I'd have them study Asian face reading. Because the majority of the people you meet have a face. That's an amazing way to read, too, by the way. Uh, yeah. Face reading is amazing. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful technique, and it is, it's got a, val a validity to it. That's well, it, profilers. Right. Well, and I had actually, something I'd studied long before uh, I'd got, or I wouldn't say long, but before I'd gotten into uh, magic and it, it really metalism, because I, I started off in card magic, making things disappear. Um, and that's, I, I could afford a deck of cards, that's why. <laughs> um, but I was always interested in social psychology and whatnot, which is probably why mentalism has come so strongly to me, and that's where I kind of am heading. Um, but uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, I believe it's Paul Ingman's work on um, facial reading. Uh, they did a show about it called Lie to Me with uh, Cal Lightman. You know, but, facial action coding system. Yes, that one. Uh, I've a lot of reading into uh, the book as well as they have programs online that teach you micro expressions. Oh, there we go. Hold on. <laughs> nice. Uh, that's it right out. there. And, Dr. Uh, Irvin sent it to me. <laughs> There you go. See, and that's and that's that's exactly what I'm talking about. Is there are things that are all around us. I mean, there's things that you do naturally. Yeah. Um, and you got. I think almost more importantly, and I mean, this is actually, I mean, really coming from from just personal experience. Uh, learning why you do what you do is so integral to learning how why other people do what they do. Because you yeah. know the core reasons, your core reasoning, you can start determining other people's core reasoning. Well, one of the reasons I, I said that if I were to start over again and, and what I do when I teach people about readings is palmistry, is that you automatically get connected to idiomotor or muscle reading connections. Um, <laughs> I, I think that the idiomotor uh, situation is vital to mentalist as well as the urban shaman because it allows you to get away with so much stuff that is pure magic. Uh, working with pendulums, working with dowsing rods, uh, as well as the contact, non-contact, mind reading factors. Uh, systems like uh, Jerome Findlay's Thought Channel. Oh, that's great. Uh, that and there are similar techniques that are all based on muscle reading. It's all based on idiomotor. So becoming as familiar as you can with that empowers you uh, as whether your character is, is a shaman mystic or a psychic. I mean, it, it's incredibly empowering. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so... <laughs> uh, the evil thoughts running through my head. At the yeah, moment. no, I'm sorry. That's that's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> you as yourself as a scam artist, I not scam people. I'll be perfectly honest, but I do it. The um, the fax system is an awesome system. It takes five years to master it if you study it daily. Um, but it's it's a powerful tool, you know. Taking classes in interrogation, criminology interrogation, will take you light years ahead of the average reader. Um, I personally believe all readers, including the shut eye readers out there, should be certified as a counselor. I think they should have therapy background under their belt. Um, because it, there are so many screwed up people in the world out there today. 
And I'm one of them, by the way. I'm very screwed up. Guilty. Well, I think everybody in Magic screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> We're damaged goods. It's okay. That's why we do what we do. <laughs> but, um... Um... No, I absolutely agree with, and I absolutely agree with you. Um, you know, having a background in counseling and in, in any sort of social psychology puts you miles ahead of of anybody. Me personally, well, I took psychology I mean, classes. I took psychology classes. Uh, I only took two classes in college, and then I dropped out. One was psychology, and 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 it, that helped me more than anything because it gives you the upper hand. Like, to, you actually know what's about the psyche and. The thing is, is with that, is it gives you, like Craig said, an edge over everybody else. And people are damaged goods, and you have to be really careful about how you approach things and what you say to them. Right, absolutely. You know, and I mean, it and it doesn't have to be like you said. You only took two courses. I took a course in psychology in high school, but I did so much self study. And more than that, talk to people. Um, there's a guy who talked to me. Um, can't remember who it was exactly, uh, but it was really important what he said, and I think that, that that really is the important part. And it was that if you want to learn how to talk to people, talk to people. If you want to learn more about people, talk to them. everybody. When I go to the gas station and somebody says hello because I'm walking through the doors, I say, hey, how are you? You know, And for a second, we have a conversation, and we have that moment. And start talking to everybody. As you guys can probably manage, imagine, I don't shut up. It's very rare. So, you know... From that, I, I, I like speaking, um, but I also like hearing. I want to hear, I want to know why. I want to hear your perspective more than anything in the world to me. Your perspective, whether I agree, disagree, like, hate, whatever, is valuable to me because you've been there for, what, 20, 30, 40 years, and you haven't been doing nothing that entire time. You've been doing something, and that's important. That's, that's a good uh, uh, attitude because you're, you're being the perpetual student. Uh, linguistically, I would change one thing to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Talk to people. Don't talk to people. Talk with people. With people. Excuse me. Yes, absolutely. Have a conversation with people. Have a yeah. real conversation was what I would say. Yeah. Uh, get rid of the iPhone. You know, get rid of the texting. Actually FaceTime with individuals. <clears throat> I mean... Um, we're fortunate to have, like, the Google system here or, or uh, uh, Skype because it allows us to connect with a lot of people that we otherwise would never be able to connect with. Um, for me and my situation, it's awesome because I can talk to, to people like you guys or I can connect with a client. Now, I got a client that's on a trip in Europe right now, you know, and... He rings me up and we have a session. No, I've got his PayPal. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, getting back on 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 topic here with with the urban shaman thing, uh, reading is a huge part of it. But there's more to uh, how a shaman would go about doing a reading. Uh, well, I think cloud busting is big too, don't you? We we touched on that earlier before you. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you get me late. You know what? I'm late. I'll admit it. I'm late. Where's Art at, by the way? Uh, Art dropped off. He's lost uh, internet, it seems. Oh, okay. But um, his internet's always sketchy. But <laughs> um, I have a book on the, that was on the market. It's been pulled called Easy Reading that some people might be familiar with. Uh, there's a sequel to it coming out next year, which goes into depth on how to do readings based on your environment, uh, which once you understand the principles behind it, it also allows you to do dream interpretation, stuff like that. Uh, it's a very heavy course in how to do readings, and we've actually had to break it up. Um, years ago, I was working on a project called the Reader's Bible, and it was so huge, I had to break it down, and that's how easy reading came out. 
uh, when I started working on the sequel, it got so huge I had to break it down, and that's how the sequel's coming out. So I'm kind of spoon feeding. I'm kind of spoon feeding things. Yeah. Uh, no, that's my phone. But it'll go to the answering All machine. Right. So, um, actually, uh, getting back to a few more questions, uh, I had a question by... That would, I think, uh, that would be great. Um, the question was, is uh, what is your actual definition of that? chain expansion? Uh, saying, uh, personally, uh, many proven evidence-based uh, scientific phenomenon seem absolutely magical. Um, we understand how they work, but they still are miraculous when you see them. Even when you when you see the falling magnet through the tube, or the metal me metal through the magnet tube, I mean, you, it looks so cool. You're slowing down an object as it falls. It, it's it's a really uh, really an awesome thing. Um, he said us. Uh, the fact that we are made of uh, long dead stars, for example, you know uh, that that was the example uh, Shane gave. Um, what is the difference between, uh, if any, between urban shamanism standpoint and a reverence and awe for the uh, aspects of the universe that we don't understand or fully understand um, as it stands? I don't know if that makes quite. There's no difference. Okay. I mean, a shaman by nature. Uh, a, they live in all of everything that's in the universe. Uh, B, they feel like they, they teach that we're all we're connected to all of it. And um, <clears throat> I mean, we can take this all the way down to reincarnation theory, where we have been all things. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, my voice is starting to give out, guys. But. Um, even from the um, scientific perspective, I mean, I know scientists, especially astronomers and so forth, they're like little kids. They're so amazed at what's out there because it is literally magic or at least magical. And they're allowed to allow that, they allow that side of for lack of a better term, their own innocence, to celebrate that enchantment that they get. Um, just because you use your rational brain doesn't mean you have to shut off your the right side of your brain. No. Allow them to work together. That's If you take it from a spiritual or Buddhist point of view, that's the goal. Put the two hemispheres together and let them work together. Oneness. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, well, uh, in that case, uh, do you guys want uh, the first part of that was uh, well, what's your uh, actual definition of magic? What is magic to you? You want Corey? to um, Magic to me is well, I mean, it's the second oldest profession in the world, first of all, and I mean. <laughs> They actually probably did it to her to actually get her to do it, so it's probably the oldest profession in the world. So, I mean, that's probably how they pay for it. So, I mean, technically the magician probably come first, in my opinion. Now, the thing is, is uh, um, magic to me is creating that moment with the spectator. I think that's key. And you have to actually have that moment with the spectator, and they have to believe in what you're doing, and they have to... you. Connections, everything, you know, and you can't talk at your spectator. You have to talk with them, like you guys were saying. And I think magic is about creating a sense of wonder. And if you can, people have problems in this world. And let's face it, I mean, it's a tough economy right now. It's tough everywhere. I mean, and the thing is, is if you can make people escape from those problems, even if it's for a 10 minute reading or, you know, from an hour and a half show or two hour show, I mean, you've done your job, in my opinion. And I think magic and mentalism in general is just about an escape from, like, normal life and making people forget about their problems. There's a truth to that. Um, we can go back to the 70s with Doug Henning and how Doug made everything magical. Rainbows and unicorns and fluffy clouds. Um, <clears throat> he taught people, he taught his audiences to 
to see magic, to look for magic. Uh, and in some ways, Doug's philosophy is very close to the urban shaman philosophy, was find the magic within yourself. Um, something that we all tend to forget to do because we're tied up in this crazy world uh, with petty people, with people that have no morals or ethics, uh, and it seems to be becoming more and more rampant. And we start feeling alone, we feel threatened. Um, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty. And we all share that as a common core. So why can't we share something more positive as a common core? Um, somebody asked me the other day about the power of prayer. Well, prayer is just another name used for magic. Um, it is the same thing as using positive affirmation and visualization work. It's the same thing as Reiki. It's it's all tied together. It's still positive energy being put out in order to change a circumstance. Um, so, you know, when it comes to what is magic, it gets deep. It gets real deep because for a spiritually centered person, it's got an entirely different point of view than it does for somebody that's more analytical. Well, and I think this topic could literally be a whole session on itself, if you want to know my honest opinion. Oh, absolutely. I, I think it could, too. I mean, that's something I, uh, whenever I see uh, or get the chance to touch on it, um, I, I, I try to talk about that magic isn't in the fact that the card disappeared. Magic's, magic's not in, that, that's not what happened. It's all up in here. It's in your head how you how that made you feel that the card appeared disappeared. Why did the card disappear? Does that matter? Well, I know when I seen it just now, it made me very warm and fuzzy. <laughs> but you are fuzzy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't have time to shave. I'm sorry. Many years ago, it's all right. Many years ago, I was sitting at the main bar of a Shimada, and if you've ever met Shimada, you know that he's got this big dragon ring that he wears. And one of the things that most people don't know about Shimada is he's a master at doing thimble magic. And he, you know, we got to talking about magic theory and so forth, and he says, this is what magic. And he tells the story about this dragon going through the hills of Japan. And his ring moves all over the place on both hands, back and forth. And it wasn't his technical skill, though that was impressive. It was the story that he told that sucked you into this enchanted thing, and you weren't watching a ring move around. You actually visualized the dragon moving around and doing all these impossible things. Um, I think the, the, the core, the most basic form of theatrical magic is being a powerful storyteller. Uh, I think that you know the, the old saying that we're all but actors playing a part. Well, if that's true, then we need to learn theater. And the most foundation, the most important foundation to being theatrical is how to follow a script, or better yet, how to tell a story. So if you spend as much time learning a new trick that you do learning a new trick, if you if you apply that same energy into learning how to tell stories and volunteer at the local library or at the local schools being a storyteller, you will see your ability to present magic grow by leaps and bounds over those that don't do it. Right, you know, and you know, when you're telling, going through and telling a story, I, I had a had a thought there. Uh, when, when you're as a, as a storyteller, uh, it doesn't matter what you're doing, whether you're an actor, um, a magician, which is just an actor with special effects, um, a, a musician, a painter. Um, you, you're you're telling a story of the, the story of what's going on in your mind, whether it be something you had heard and you're relaying like a, an old fable, or maybe it's a whole new story that that's been created up in here. You're trying to convey what's in your mind to somebody else, and I think that kind of wraps back into the connection of people. 
Yeah, well, I mean, we were talking about doing readings of things. Um, being a showman, showman in general, being a reader, being a shaman, means that you have communication skills. And you know, we, we, we see and hear very little in the magic community about how to be an effective communicator. But if we look at the guys that are on top, even like Copperfield, he's a big stage illusionist. Get rid of the boxes and listen to what David does. He learned from some of the best. And uh, I remember a story about Copperfield, my mentor, and David did an opening for Bill Cosby uh, at the Las Vegas Hilton. This is years ago before David was big. And he comes up and asks my teacher, you know, what do you think? And my teacher says, sit here and watch Mr. Cosby. Now, Bill Cosby walks out with a bar stool and a cigar and does two hours instead of 16 dancing girls and a million dollars worth of equipment. He holds an audience. He has an audience in the palm of his hands just talking to them. That's what magicians miss. That's one of the things the urban shaman is trying to revive, rekindle, is how to create magic in the head without doing a trick. Out Absolutely. How to create um, magical experience. That was very well said. And I, I mean, I think, to be honest with you, you couldn't have worded that any better. That, I mean, I agree with that 100%. You know, and I, I think that co uh, a lot of comedians right now really embody uh, the best storytellers. I don't know if either of you are familiar with John Leguizamo. Uh, I but, am. Uh, he is a great storyteller. Um, his, enti his entire act is just him telling stories about his childhood, and they're really, really funny. He makes he shows you the funny, but you know, a lot of it's really him just telling you a story about how he grew up and his brother and this, that, and the other, and just conveying his experience to another person. I mean, that's, that's I mean, you, I, of course, I mean, there are the stand-up comics, which is, you know, so uh, airlines, right? Um, but I, I think the, the comics that go out there and actually just tell a story, really, um, you have, I mean, what is it, the, the, the George Carlins, you know, yeah. um, really went out and just, just un unleashed themselves on, on the public and in doing so um, brought them closer to himself. I think that that's really what they were doing. Well, people connect with the storytellers like Billy Crystal, Whoopi Goldberg, Steve Martin, um, George. They don't look at them as comics or celebrities. They look at, at them as friends. We connect with them. Red Skelton is a great example. Everybody saw him as a personal friend that visited them once a week. <clears throat> Even Ed Sullivan, to some degree, had that image. But, I mean, Red knew how to tell stories as a clown, but also as a serious actor. Well, I think Johnny Carson also had that ability, even though he didn't have much time on the show. Do you agree? Uh, I can see why you would say that. I don't think it's the same caliber of thing. No, it's not the same caliber, but I'm saying in the time slot that he had available for that, he was very good at that, and the connection that he built with his, his guests. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I hate to do this to you guys, but I'm going to have to cut this short. My voice is about dead. Absolutely. No, I understand, Craig. Uh, you've been sounding hoarser and hoarser. I've been wondering about cutting this off. We are sitting at... An hour and 45 minutes, just me and you, uh, between the two of us. So you go ahead. Uh, you can go ahead and take a break. That's absolutely fine. Um, there was a couple other questions in, in here, and Stuart Palm, uh, Stuart Palm just actually logged in. Uh, oh, he well, just, Stuart. I'll, I'll do my best to answer. Um, well, uh, there aren't any questions from him, but there's uh, just a couple of small things. Uh, the rest of the questions are really simple. If you guys would like to answer them, uh, if not, we can uh, finish up, say, with Ma Morgan since uh, he missed out in the first uh, 45 minutes, and we can sit and maybe touch on some of the earlier topics. So, um, 
just as a quick thing, um, as an urban shaman, I saw one in here that I kind of liked. If uh, people asked you to perform magic without preparation, uh, what do you guys think you'd perform? Depends on circumstance. Yeah. Um, if I'm outside with people, nine times out of ten, I'll start off with something along the lines of cloud busting. Um, because that pulls in nature. It takes it out of my hands. It's not a magic trick. Um, I want them to get a, a more rounded experience. Um, and at the same time, I've got mentalism to fall back on. Um, now, that's not to say that I won't do more traditional tricks, uh, you know, coin magic and so forth. Sometimes, if I'm approached and it's a young person, they key on visual more than they do something where it requires patience. So cloud busting don't necessarily work with an eight-year-old. It can, but you better make sure that the air is moving with it. <laughs> um, but um, you know, to do um, you know coins across or something along those lines with a kid. That's that's going to create a more uh, indelible uh, impression with them. Um, that, that's something I should touch on. Um, the urban shaman combines magic with mentalism, which is a big taboo if you're going to promote yourself as a mentalist. Um, there are ways of doing it that makes it work. Uh, doing sponge balls and then going into a Q&A is not one of them. <clears throat> but um, <laughs> Oh my god, that was great. Pulling it off. <laughs> but um, yeah, I am a big one on knowing the basics of magic. You know, generic sleight of hand. Because then you can do almost anything with almost anything. Um, I think that um, studying specialty situations like there, I know Stephen's Magic used to have a whole bunch of videos on improvisational uh, magic effects as well as bar hopping type effects. Um, knowing how to work with small objects is the key here. So you can borrow items. So you can, you know, like I said earlier, work with the items that are nearest you, uh, whether it's a, a bottle or a bottle cap or, you know, borrowing a cigarette from somebody, whatever the case may be. You should be able to incorporate that into uh, your presentation. And you should already have a rehearsed, in your mind as well as physically rehearsed approach that you're going to take that makes it more than a trick that gives them a magical experience instead of a simple you know here's the cigarette watch it disappear type thing um, my mind's going a thousand different directions on this but I, I that's the best I can do for you at the moment. that's fine um Right before we uh, right before we lose you here, um, we had uh, and I don't know if you were in during the uh, call when I announced this. Um, Bill Montana was offering up his uh, book, uh, yeah. and it was uh, the bridge. And I wanted to go ahead and, and give that away before we lose you. Um, did we want to do it the way we normally do, which is uh, just message me and we'll pick a winner or raffle it off, or how do you guys want to do that? I've not done that before, so I'll leave that in your ballpark. All right. Well, in that case, um, go ahead and send me uh, an email to uh, arborton at gmail.com. I'll go ahead and post a link in the description, but send me arborton.com and just send me a message saying urban shamanism. I'll go ahead and raffle that book off to uh, anybody watching at the uh, end of the show-ish, and uh, we'll get that taken care of. Sound good? Okay. Um, the other thing, too, is anybody's got questions, please feel free to uh, IM me, <clears throat> and I'll try to get back to you. Um, 
Alex is aware of the fact that I have problems because of my MS of being able to talk for too long. So um, I appreciate the fact that everybody showed up, and um, I'm always available. Everybody should know that. I'm very approachable. I just growl like a nasty old bear sometimes. Show them the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> That's so you true. Hope the bear. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> He's a cuddly bear, though. People don't understand how cuddly he can be. Oh. I cuddled with him. You did? <laughs> yeah. I... Oh, a cuddly bear. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, you were drunk. It's okay. No, um... It happened in Vegas, so it stays in Vegas. <laughs> Never happened. <laughs> um... All right. Um, you, if I, you don't have. Uh, I'm not going to address uh, you anymore. If you, if you'd like to go off, I know your voice is getting uh, weak. Uh, I'll continue with Morgan. If you'd oh. like to stay on and just chime in whenever you can, that'd be perfectly yeah. fine, though. It's perfectly right? fine. Okay. I wanted to jump back to Morgan, and uh, I wanted to touch on some of the questions we hit before you popped on. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Sounds great. All right. Uh, one of the first questions I had asked, and I'd love to get your take on it as well, is um, why do you think uh, there's been an, a recent sur uh, resurgence, or not so much resurgence, but a, a recent movement strongly towards urban shamanism? And where do you think it's going in the coming years? Well, I, I literally think it's because it's so fascinating and it's so real and it's so, like, organic because you know, it's the organic nature of urban shamanism that makes it so unique. And I think people are going to start moving towards it because it's it's almost, it's so real to the spectator. And I really think that one of the big things about it is, is it's going to become popular because of people like uh, Jerome Finley and, and Craig and Art and, you know, multiple other people that are really turning the bar. I mean, and people are just going to want to do this kind of material because it's so amazing and so impossible. And it's just organic. And that's what I love so much about it. Like in the last question that you asked, you know, what do you do when first thing you perform? I don't know what I'm going to perform because I have an hour and a half to two hours of material that I can do from nothing because I use all borrowed objects and I don't even carry a Sharpie or anything. Now, the thing is, is, I mean, it's, it's, I love the organic nature of urban shamanism and I think that's why it's going to have like this huge following here in the near future and it's going to, literally, I think it will become its own branch of magic. I like it because it kind of branches, it kind, it's kind of this weird thing that encompasses slide a hand in magic, it encompasses mentalism, and it just almost hits that gray area towards charlatanism. Because, again, you don't disclaim. You don't want to go off. You're, you're letting people somewhat believe what they want to believe, which, to some extent, as long as you're not forcing somebody what to believe, that's fine. Um, letting people make their own decisions about things. Yeah, you never want to force your beliefs on anyone. I mean, I, whether it's politics, religion, anything like that. I mean, I don't force my beliefs on anybody. I mean, the conclusion they come up with through the melting pot of ideas, because everything that I, I've learned over the years I use in urban shamanism. For example, everything that you have is like a toolbox, and you never know when you're going to need that tool. That's why reading the basics and learning the fundamentals of magic and mentalism is so important because you want to build this toolbox up the best that you can because you never know when you're going to need that tool in that situation. That is almost verbatim what Peter Turner said in our interview. Are you serious? Uh, I would say almost verbatim. What sans the accent? Oh, well... Would you like me to re-say it in an English accent? I would. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, so no, that was almost uh, verbatim. And, I, and Craig even uh, uh, had put uh, mentioned that somewhat uh, earlier too, a very similar thing in that these are all, even talking to people, these are all tools that we just use um, to convey our meaning and our point. Uh, we're, we are storytellers, and when you get to that, the sleight of hand is just an effect. The mentalism is, uh, you know, just an affect. Um, it, it, they're all just things tying in to help convey your message. 
Um, can I ask you a quick question to get off topic, and then we'll come right back? But um, would it be possible, since you know um, some people may have tuned out because Craig left, you know, he was a really big draw on this. Is Actually, there any way that your ship's gone up? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, what I was going to ask you is: Is there any way we could promote the bending for tomorrow? At around the same time, I'm doing TV early in the morning, but I'll be back around noonish my time, um, and do the mass metal bending and get as many people online as possible, and I'll do it tomorrow, and make it like an event for Believe in Magic. We could we could do something like that. Um, we probably have to work out the the, the, the details and whatnot, um, but. Yeah, that I don't see a problem with that at all. Uh, that way we can promote it and get a lot of people there and really been like a lot of people's silverware at once. Right, absolutely. Um, it is... Let's see, we're on Saturday. Yeah, I'm looking at my calendar, and as far as I know, Believe doesn't have a uh, event tomorrow. We don't okay. have events until Monday, uh, which is our Q&A with Ben Cardell, which I believe is in the audience today. Hey, Ben. Oh, he is. Um, I'm excited to hear his, his interview. He's really, really a sharp guy. I'm, ex I'm excited I got it. Uh, <laughs> um, but, yeah, so we don't have anything uh, until Monday. So if you'd like to uh, do that, I would love to figure out a way to get it all hosted up. Uh, maybe it's something we can put in the performance space. Okay, that sounds good. Let's do it. All right, all right. was there any other questions you wanted to ask me? Uh, let me go through and see on some of the ones that I touched on without you. Um, oh, here's a good one. And if Craig wanted to chime in at some point, that would be cool. Um, I uh, This is uh, probably going to be a really easy one, uh, but Sean McCarthy was asking, uh, how do you describe what you do to a layperson? In one word, connection. First, you have to build that rapport with that audience member and leave them wondering basically what just happened here and let them process the information and take it away and let them believe what they want to believe. Right, but I think what he was asking was is how, if, a, if say a layman, layman came up to you and said, well, what do you do? How would you explain that to him? I, I would tell them oh, that I'm shaman. <laughs> oh, we got Craig back. What was I that, Craig? Tell them that I'm a shaman. <laughs> <laughs> that's an easy answer. Yeah, I mean that's basically the same thing that I I say. Or I'm a you know, um, uh, you know that's really the easiest way to put it. To be honest with you, I mean this movement is really growing. And I mean, if you just say that you're a shaman, I mean everybody knows what that is for the most part, you know. And it, it's it's pretty simple, really. Right. I mean, not the performance and execution of it. It takes practice. And the one thing about it, especially with, like, the reading aspect, there's not a lot of readers that are really, really experienced because they're kind of scared to go out and do it at first, you know, because the only way you can become a good reader is to actually do it on somebody. And there's that fear of failing. It's not like, it's not like magic. And it it's really intimidates a lot of people, I think, at first when they go out and they try to read somebody, you know, because they're afraid they're going to fail, and it keeps a lot of people from becoming readers. Well, and I'll tell you something that I did, I mean, because I had no influence at all um, when I was, uh, when I had started reading. Um, just, I would, you know, I'd, I'd tell, I, or somebody would say that I did it, or I would just say, yeah, you know, I, I'm good with people, and I, I can talk to people, and, you know, I, I get them really well, and I can kind of kind of read them. And I just kind of really kind of brush it off, not really explain too much what I would do, and wait for them to ask me and say, well, what about me? What do you, what do you know about me? And at that point, a lot of the times, I would just kind of take them away as a privately so we could sit down and talk and not have distraction. Um, but... That way, when you're doing it in such a non-pressure environment where it's like, hey, well, what can you tell me about me? I can just sit there and talk to you and, you know, and tell you whatever I know, and I'll be wrong. I'll admit that I'll be wrong, and that's it. And you find that you, as you practice more and just do it more and become more in tune with people, you, you just you stop missing as much. Like, it's not, it's not about hitting more. You just stop missing as much. Well, I think a big thing, too, is you actually have to care about your audience. I think so many people just run through the motions, and um, they really don't have that sense of caring about their audience. When you're doing you know, urban shamanism, you really have to care about your audience, I think. 
or yeah. mental in any, any branch of magic, really. You have to care. I mean, and it really shows if you don't care. Right, absolutely. I know uh, we were uh, we didn't really talk about hypnosis, uh, but in a lot of ways, hypnosis uh, can be tied into things like urban shamanism. In that, I actually use that, that with what I actually use that with it. Um, I've been a hypnotist for twenty years. Well, right, and I I like that you. you with hypnotism, you're not doing anything. You're suggesting that it can be done. That's merely what you're suggesting, suggesting the possibility of, and everything else goes on inside their head, and that's how it ends up working. I um, should have hmm? I should have I should have touched on that earlier because um, suggestion is a very big part of urban shamanism and how we create quote unquote real magic. Um, uh, I can't remember his name now. Um, young man put out a book called Pygmalion uh, Effect. Uh, he also put out a book called Bridge uh, that touches on how to use pure suggestion. Uh, and it's some beautiful stuff that he's come up with. Uh, I know Kenton Nepper has talked about this for decades. Um, and using linguistic patterns and so forth. Um, it's it's an important skill uh, for the urban shaman because um, we're trying to trick the mind to learn something, and and that's the way it's accomplished is through the would, through the innuendo. Well, see, and I, uh, now I'm going to have to change um, uh, your linguistically. Uh, what, what you're saying is less of trick, and I always feel it's more of um, prep. You're prepping the mind to learn something. Yes. Well, I had a I read one of the questions from Stuart Palm, and he asked, "Wouldn't it be more of a trick to do mass metal bending for a lot of people?" And I, I you know, I disagree with that because I'm not touching the silverware, and it's 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 I'm not at your house, I'm not doing anything, and it's one of those things that is impossible because I'm not there and you know it's not that it's a trick it's more realistic you'll just have to see the presentation of it you know because it's not like I'm you know sitting here hey say bend you know or whatever like that I mean there's actually a presentation to it and Geller was the master of this I just came up with a way to make it you know my own and really take it and have an actual method with it to where it works all the time versus you know different things and I mean I, I think that just because it's a mass metal bin doesn't make it fake I think it, it makes it more real because it's happening in your hands and I'm not there you gotta be careful with that though Morgan because I did a, a radio spot where I did basically the same thing I had people place watches by the radio and, and or silverware and so forth and I ended up with a guy who's trying to sue me for stopping his Rolex are you serious? I'm serious. <laughs> oh my it's God. happened about 15 years ago in Nashville. I'll be You're sure to not do any watches anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that's what, but that's what you're trying to do. You're invoking real belief. Yeah. So shame on you. <laughs> um, actually, Stuart Palm... Um, Messaged again, he said, uh, sorry I'm being very verbal here, but in the world of shamanism, it's generally considered bragging to claim uh, to claim that title. Um, I would have to see what title he's talking about. Uh, so for someone who has... I think he was talking about shamanism. Yeah. Because oh, I read shaman it. has a title? Okay. He says, uh, for someone who has a knowledge of shamanism, this would, uh, would be taken as a proclamation that you're fake. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? There's a truth to that. There is a truth to that. Um, when somebody asks me and I respond with that I'm a shaman, I explain to them that, you know, my training, my background around that. Um, <clears throat> because most people don't, most people don't have the background to understand what it is you do. No, it's just like me saying I'm a psychic. You know, that's, that nine times out of ten, that's what I'll say anyway. But, um, 
you know, I, I uh, love Jerome uh, Finley's line of, uh, I'm an entertainer who just happens to be psychic. Right. And approaching it in that context. Well, and I think that's why uh, my, my personal <laughs> disclaimer that um, I'm a scam artist doesn't say I'm a fake. I've never once said I'm fake. I just said uh, scam artist implies that I'm going to take you for what you're worth. Yeah, you know that's that's really all I've ever said, and I and I didn't. It just kind of occurred to me when when we were talking when when you were just saying that that that's that's probably what it is. Is I'm not saying that I'm fake. I'm never framing it that way. I'm giving them something to chew on that is something that they can understand. Everybody knows what a scam artist is. That's a very Harry Anderson way of putting. It. <laughs> well, I think when explaining what you are to a layperson, I mean, it doesn't really say it's a fake because the thing is, 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 I mean, you're giving a title of what you actually are, and a layperson doesn't look at it as, wow, this guy's a fake. You know what I'm saying? Mm. It's all in the context of how you word it and how you present what you are in describing what you are. I mean, if you say you're a mentalist, nobody knows what the hell a mentalist really is. You have to explain what a mentalist is. If you say you're a psychic, they incidentally know what that is. Some people know what shamanism is. Some people don't know what it is. So sometimes you have to tell them what it is. And I think that, you know, explaining it, like Craig said, is very, very important. But, I mean, it's a title like anything. And, you know, what are you? I mean, you can also say, you know, I don't really know what I am, but I have this gift, or whatever. I mean, it doesn't matter, but the thing is, is, I mean, I, lay people don't look at it like that. Only magicians think about stuff like that, I think. That was actually something Stuart said uh, uh, was it a little bit earlier. He was like, uh, why, won't pe uh, why won't people start getting the idea that um, the only people who care about disclaimers are magicians? <laughs> well, that's very true. I agree with him 100%, because, I mean... That's an absolute fact. It is. Lay, lay people don't care? No. Lay people would rather believe. Absolutely. Uh, they want to believe. That's why they're coming to you. There are people out there that believe David Copperfield can actually fly because he's Jewish and studied the Kabbalah. You know, it's just like Doug Henning could really walk through brick walls because he was in Transcendental Meditation. But, I mean, people want to believe. They want to have something to hook on to. And that goes back to what I said earlier about the urban shaman movement and what it represents um, and why it's timely is because the public is looking for something to actually invest their faith in. Um, the church has screwed them over. Politicians have screwed them over. I mean, it just... You know, they're being raped by big corporations nowadays. <clears throat> People want something that takes them back to their innocence, takes them back to simpler times, and a reason to hope. That was exactly what I was thinking the entire time you were saying that, hope. Anytime you, uh, when, when I try to convey the idea that when I leave somebody, I leave somebody better, most of the time I'm, I, what I'm giving them is, you know, hope and confidence, you know, confidence to believe in yourself, confidence to believe that you can change yourself and you can do whatever you need to. Exactly. That's, that's, that's what I'm trying to give you. It's the, the hope that you probably lost a long time ago where you don't believe you can do anything anymore because the world likes to tell you you can't. Yep. Yep. Well, and I always, like, when I'm cold reading, it doesn't matter what it is. I mean, even if I get some, you know, negative things... And I think we're losing you, Mario. Huh? Uh, you're broken up. Is that for you too, Craig? No, nope, but it's, it's freezing on my end too. Okay, so that's... uh. All right, so well, you were just a little uh, frozen up there. Try again? Okay. Yeah, what I was saying is, is even in cold reading, um, whether I give a couple of bad things that may have happened in their life, I always come full circle and give the positive to an ending because I think you have to end it on a good note, and I gener I mean, I always do. And the thing is, is, and I try to make it a confidence builder and a boost for them and get them excited about life and, you know, you know, kind of leave those points that may have happened in their life behind them and move forward, you know. And I think that's the thing about it, that I have a responsibility 
to make them feel good after a reading, even though I've disclosed some things that may be uncomfortable. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, I had uh, one of my first like big readings I ever did for somebody. I sat a girl down and we just talked, and I told her things about herself that she'd never told anybody, and she'd been holding these things in for so long, and just felt like and just dealing with them without ever having to do anything, without her having to tell me anything. I was able to tell that she was in pain and realize it and react and let her know why I knew. And it really, if nothing else, gave her, one, the idea that, hey, look, things happen to us and it's okay. You know, we're just people. And two, it gave her somebody to talk to something about. Something Craig said earlier was, and, and you, I know you said too, Morgan, was sometimes people just want to talk to somebody. And it's, it's nice to use your powers, your gifts, your, your skills to be able to bring people out of this wall, this barrier, this shell that they constantly put themselves in. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I mean, I agree with Stuart to an ex, you know, extent on, on what he was saying about the, the title, but a lot of people, I mean, want a definition of what you actually are, whether you're a psychic or a mentalist or a magician or a clown or, a, you know, whatever, or a shaman. I mean, I, I just think that there's nothing wrong with that because you're just educating them on what you are, which I think people like a little education on what you are because, you know, they kind of want to know what they're getting into at times, especially when it comes to shamanism, you know, because it's so believable and so real because it's so organic. Absolutely. Um, we are coming up on uh, at two hours fifteen minutes. So, um, unless you want to keep on going, uh, we are come close to running out of questions for the most part. Um, we uh, I was thinking about going ahead and wrapping it up here. Does uh, anybody have any problem with that? I don't. <clears throat> I don't. Yeah, but you don't, Craig. <laughs> Morgan, do you, oh, we can keep on going. I have nothing but time. You know, I'm good. I mean, I, I think we covered a lot, and I mean, I'm sorry. I just want to apologize again that I was late, and, you know, I'm, I'm just glad I got to make it in and on the discussion and everything, and I like to thank Craig for his wisdom, and, I mean, he was amazing. Do you mind if I give a plug real quick? Uh, I don't mind, Craig. Go ahead. Go for it. Um, I'm doing a show in Metropolis, Illinois, which is my favorite city because it's the home of Superman. <laughs> And I'm helping restore the Massac Theater. Now, you can actually, if you can't make it to Metropolis, you can buy tickets and watch it streaming online and see my live show for like 30 minutes of it. Now, the thing is, is there, the ticket price is donate what you can. So all the money, 100% of it's going to go to the Massac Theater. And I, I really would like people to turn out and see some of the stuff that I do live in my show versus what they've seen on the DVDs and stuff like that because you'll get a, more of a sense of who I am and my real character. And the thing is, is um, it goes for a good cause, and I'm really excited to be a part of it. And the thing is, is it's donate what you can. So, I mean, it's not like there's a set ticket price or anything like that. But I'd love to get, you know, a lot of the community there and, and just, you know, I, it'd be nice. Absolutely. I planned on attending personally. So uh, I saw your post up on the walls and, Got uh, already got it all set up, so I I'm going. Um, oh, thank you. That's a worthy cause. What was that? I think it's a worthy cause. Absolutely. Oh, thank you so much, Craig. So uh, with that, um, we uh, I'm not going to announce the winner. I'll go ahead and uh, message the winner directly for the contest because that means I would have to sit here on dead air searching for the winner. So I'll go ahead and announce that here shortly and just contact the winner directly. Uh, besides that, I uh, just want to thank uh, you guys. I, first, I want to thank Art for escape, his uh, Master of Escape act that he did earlier. I thought that that was absolutely <laughs> um, <laughs> He did such a good job. Um, I want to thank uh, both uh, Craig and Morgan here. They've been both awesome. You guys are just fascinating and fantastic to talk to. Um, I want to thank Laura for going ahead and setting a lot of this up. You know, Without her setting these things up, we wouldn't have them. Um, and besides that, I think that's pretty good. A anything to add, gentlemen? You know what? I just want to thank you. I'm truly honored, you know, that you guys would have me on this. And I'd like to thank everybody that's has supported me for over the years. And you know what? I, I just, you know, if you ever need me for anything, like Craig said, I'm always available. 
I always answer my private messages on Facebook, so feel free to message me if you ever have any questions. And, I mean, I love all my fans, and I, I like to consider them friends. So please get in touch with me, and, and you know, I'm very approachable, um, even though I don't blink most of the time. Um, it's like I just blink there to make people feel comfortable. Um, it, the thing is, is, is you know, e email me or just give me a message and, I'm just honored to be a part of this and, you know, with the legendary Craig and Art when he was on. and I mean, thank you guys so much for having me. Absolutely, man. How about you, Bear? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. You already said your goodbyes. Thanks. Well, we're actually going to go cuddle after this. <laughs> <laughs> That's a long reach. <laughs> All right, well, uh, gentlemen, again, it's been a pleasure. This is going to be the end of our broadcast, and uh, if anybody has any other uh, questions or concerns, uh, both the guys are uh, readily available to answer questions, as well as you can send them my, uh, my way, and I can always uh, relay uh, them as well. So thank you all very much for um, watching, and uh, that will be the end of our broadcast. Bye, guys. Have a good day, guys.